Welcome again to the SBA MFA Fine Arts talk series. This afternoon, it's my pleasure to introduce Caitlin Pomerantz. Caitlin is an artist and educator. Put another way, they educate and make art. Um, and it seems that education and art making are equally important to Caitlin Pomerantz. And that education is as much a part of their creative slash critical practice as is art making. That comes through in a lot of ways. Um, and it, it comes through um, in Caitlin's uh, CV, actually, they resonate. Unlike some artists and also in their bio, educational practice, teaching, uh, design courses, things like that is really foregrounded. It's given time and prominence. A lot of artists who teach, they may not even mention on their resume or CV that they're on faculty somewhere, you know? Um, so I wanna honor Caitlin for lifting up educational practice as something that is worth celebrating uh, and worth paying attention to. And I don't know, can be of equal importance in an artist's life and practice. So Caitlin writes, Caitlin teaches, they design curricula, they make mixed media artwork and they make printed matter and video and they tend land and they tend sea. And you'll learn, I think, probably about all those things. In Caitlin's own well-chosen words, they, here I'm quoting, sort of remixing a quote, um, they create space for reflection around the ways in which consumptive and extractive powers, think about consumption as in like consumer economics and the way we consume fossil fuels and think of extraction as like uh, pumping oil out and gas out of the ground and mining for coal, but also things like lithium uh, and cobalt, which go into electric car batteries. Reflecting around the ways in which consumptive and extractive powers have shaped our planet, our societies, and our relationships. How consumption and extraction how those powers shape the planet, human society, and our relationships, and making space for honoring what has been lost, both by us and I think also by others who came before us, um, for recognizing what we wish to save, and for envisioning what comes next, how we could work together to shape the future. So, as is my normal habit, I'm going to foreground some solo exhibitions. Um, solo exhibitions, lots and lots of group exhibitions. Solo exhibitions at places like Traction Company in Pennsylvania, Little Berlin in Philadelphia, the C.R. Ettinger Gallery in Philly, Adjacent to Life Space here in New York City, Practice Space in Philadelphia, Anne Marie Garden in Maryland. I think it's an island off of the coast of Maryland, um, where they also did a residency, um, and Brodsky Gallery at UPenn, University of Pennsylvania. Um, their work has also been collected by numerous museums, including the Philadelphia History Museum, um, University of Pennsylvania's Common Press, uh, the Fisher Fine Arts Library at UPenn, Franklin Furness Artist Books Collection at Pratt, and the Joan Flash Artist Book Collection at SAIC in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Caitlin has participated in residencies. Well, one coming up in Sicily, 
estampería oficina del notario, notario. My Italian pronunciation probably sounds more like Spanish, apologies. Sorry, Sylvia. Um, cabin time in the Eastern Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, land arts of the American West. Uh, Lugo land in Emilia Romagna in Italy. Sangam Center in Bangalore, India. Land Lab at the School Kill Center in Pennsylvania, Rare in Philadelphia, uh, and the well-known A20 Philadelphia Mural Arts Program, and a few others. They've received awards and fellowships from the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, the Knight Foundation, Rima Hortman Foundation, and a bunch of others, and have written for Hyperallergic, Bomb, Title, Extant, Imagination's Journal, and has essays forthcoming in uh, books by Palgrave Macmillan and Columbia Teachers College. They went to school um, for teaching uh, an M Arts in Education. Uh, no, sorry, EDM in Arts and Education at Harvard, at their Harvard's Graduate School of Education, which is also my mom's alma mater. Um, at UPenn, an MFA in interdisciplinary art with a teaching certificate uh, and a Penn Design Merit Scholarship and a BA in art history and visual art, Phi Beta Kappa from <laughs> University of Chicago. Um, and uh, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Caitlin. Yep. All right, hi everybody. Um, now that I've fully dissociated from that, <laughs> hearing my resume read aloud. Thank you, though, Mark. <laughs> um, yeah, so, ooh, TVs um, give me anxiety, but all right, I'm going to dive in. Um, I just wanted to begin by uh, thanking uh, Mark and the department and Isabel um, for the invitation here. I am lucky enough to have crossed paths with Isabel uh, in my time teaching at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and was really delighted to be invited. And um, thank you to all of you for spending your afternoon here with me. Um, SVA holds a pretty interesting place in my consciousness. Um, I actually grew up on 23rd Street and Avenue D and walked by the 3rd Avenue SVA building almost every day of my life from age, well, whenever I could walk to 18 years old. And um, it was the first art school that I understood uh, is an art school. And there's something called art school and you know people stand outside and smoke cigarettes and look cool. And <laughs> that's an art school. So um, I did not know at that time what a place uh, art school and art programs would come to hold in my life, but um, I can maybe thank SVA for planting some sort of seed. Um, in this talk, uh, well, I'll just preface it by saying I'm going to be doing some kind of reading uh, and some extemporizing. If you have questions um, as I'm rattling off and I can make eye contact with you, please feel free to raise your hand and just ask while I'm talking. Um, and then of course there will be time after for Q&A. Um, in this talk, I will be sharing about my interdisciplinary work as an artist, educator, writer, scholar, and yes, land and sea tender for from over the past 10 plus years. I'm not trying to show you everything I've done, but some key things from throughout that chunk of time. Also, how's the sound? Cool, thank you. Um, I do this in the spirit of extending my story to you in hopes that there may be moments of resonance and inspiration, but also to show my own way of being an artist, which encompasses a lot of practices beyond the making of art. The work I make is hard to pin down. I don't focus on selling it. It often exists beyond gallery spaces. And I work in a lot of manners with lots of different materials. And I do make it work, um, arguably. <laughs> um, I wish I had seen more artists like this in the years that I was struggling to minimize and streamline my way of working and being. 
Um, so if you notice a chaotic or tangled feeling to this talk or to my work, I would just say, yes, good observation. Um, so yeah, we'll get into all of that. And for now, I'm just going to dive into the work itself and specifically a project that for me represented a kind of turning point in my work. Okay. Um, so in 2019, just prior to the pandemic, I was invited by a collaborative curatorial team uh, run by Kristen Neville Taylor and Ricky Giannis called Green Sun uh, to be part of a group exhibition about solar energy. I created a piece for this show inspired by the 1954 science fiction short story, All Summer in a Day by Ray Bradbury. Has anybody by chance read this very short story? No? Okay. It's like a two pager, so when you're on the train or wherever, I recommend it. Um, the pieces that I made for this show consisted of seven lifted cyanotype prints back mounted on plexiglass. Cyanotypes, as many of you I'm sure know, are prints made from the sun reacting to a light sensitive emulsion, turning the areas that it hits dark blue, except for where the light is blocked, which in this case was the text. After making the prints, I lifted and transformed the blue into hues of gold um, using various detergents. It was a process that despite trying to control, I had little control over. Um, and it felt wholly controlled by the light conditions of the sun interacting spontaneously with water, paper, and the ensuing alchemy. I also made a video which I will show clips of and a Rizzo uh, takeaway print reproducing Bradbury's story. The story is about a class of students who are living on the planet Venus, where it rains every day and the sun comes out only once every seven years. There is one student named Margot who moved to Venus later than the others who can still remember the sun, whereas the other students cannot. On the day that the sun is supposed to come out, Margot offers some brilliant descriptions of what she remembers of it. Um, these are the descriptions that I featured in the prints. So she says, I think the sun is a flower that blooms for just one hour. It's like a penny, it's like a fire in the stove, a warmness like a blushing in the face, in the body, in the arms and legs, and trembling hands. The students are so jealous of Margot and her memories of the sun that they lock her away. When the sun finally comes out that day, spoiler alert, I spoiled it. Um, <laughs> so when the sun finally comes out that day for the first and only time in seven years, Margot misses it. She's locked in a closet. Yeah. <laughs> The students are awash in horror when they remember what they have done. I read the story as a child and mostly forgot about it. I think it is no mistake that it burbled up into my consciousness in the recent years where the effects of climate change and global warming have started to become intensely visible. visible. And the public has begun to see more clearly the disproportionate ecological consequences of extractive capitalism on black and brown communities in the US, communities in the global south, people in regions profiting the least yet suffering the most. The story makes me think of possible futures beyond an unlivable earth, but mostly about greed, jealousy, and the harms that humans enact upon one another to have superior environmental access, waterfront views, land to build real estate on, and the like. A coin large enough to buy the world with is beautiful, but also sounds like a devilish capitalist gamble, one that we are currently in 2023 experiencing whether we wish to be gambling or not. As part of the installation, I made a video where I interviewed my six nieces and nephews who are all under the age of 12. I prompted them only by asking them to tell me about the sun. They definitely did some research about the sun before I asked them. Um, the imagery from the video is actually an accident from leaving the phone on in my pocket. Um, I'm gonna play a few clips from the video. What are we supposed to be saying? The sun! The yeah, sun is 93 million miles away and it is very, 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 very big. And it's the biggest star in the universe. No, I don't think it's the biggest star in the universe. It's not, it's not close. Like a it's not? Year. Like in the middle category towards the small it's, category. It's the middle of the, it's the middle of the universe. No. 
The okay. sun is very big, and it's a star, and the sun is 93 million miles away, and yeah. And, and if you touch it, you will go on fire. If you go anywhere you. near it, you go miles away, and the surface of the sun can reach near roughly 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit at its hottest. Password a little bit. In years from now, it's possible that it it will explode, but Ooh. all stars do that, so nothing new. Yay. But I am yeah. going to die. So like, yeah. um, Would we? Uh, well, yeah. we'd have eight minutes to live because it takes actually eight minutes for like to reach Earth. So we'd have eight minutes to live and eight minutes to uh, do the last things of our. Would say goodbye to Mickey. Yeah, Mickey's not my stuffed animal. Mm. Yeah, it's not like the sun is gonna explode anytime soon. And even if it was, you should probably use the sun ra the sun's last rays for something useful, like on Mars. Before just choosing, wow, Earth is like the only planet that I can actually be safe in. What if there's actually such a thing as aliens? What if there's actually such a thing as aliens? thought, wow, this is Mars, and then just turned themselves into a alien kind of guy, and just like got so caught up in being an alien that it actually thought he was an alien. And then he came back to Earth in the so-called strange machine thingy and saw us and thought we were the aliens. That could happen like that, but like no TV and no talking on the phone. Sometimes adults do extra work on their computers just to do extra work. And I think that that's using up a lot of electricity. So when you do extra work, then your computer or phone battery goes a little bit down. And then when it's completely down, you have to recharge it again, which is using a lot of electricity just to charge it up. Hmm. Listen to random things that isn't even important. Right. Um, so what astonished me about this shoot is that the children so quickly went from describing the sun and its heat and glory to talking about its potential to explode, the eight minutes they would have left to live, what they would grab before dying, Mickey, and the wastefulness of adults and their use of electricity for unimportant reasons. The kids opened up themes of accountability, mortality, urgency, grief, waste, and judgment, all in the span of a few minutes. I had been making work as an artist for about a decade prior to making this piece, doing all sorts of investigations of place, environment, material, ecology, transitional spaces. But this piece represented something new to me, tapping head on into themes of ego anxiety, the grief of bearing witness to the Anthropocene, and in the words of theorist Catherine Yusuf, the need to name the masters of broken earths. It made me question the posture, the posture of neutral viewer or witness that I think I occupied in a lot of earlier work, some of which I'll be showing. It also made me wonder about the possibility of art to give agency to the inanimate, to have the sun do the work of telling a story about itself through these prints, a kind of recursivity and self-examination, perhaps aligning with ideas of the rights of nature movement. I appreciated sharing the writing of another writer through this work, holding space for discussion and community around the meaning of this story, of his story, and speaking with people, kids, about their feelings and apperceptions. Um, oh, okay, a little bit more about me, which as I was struggling to think of what I wanted to say, I just Googled myself, <laughs> um, which is a way to do something, I'm not sure what. Um, so through my work as an artist, writer, teacher, land and sea tender, sometimes curator, 
I engage in a lot of the themes that can be seen in the project I just showed. After years of feeling pressure to do only one thing or another, I now think that my different creative and relational modes deeply inform one another and all contribute to what I think of as my work. I do this work from the identity position as a queer, Jewish, white, able-bodied person who has lived most of my life on unceded Lenape land. Land and its history, its psychic status as place holds a lot of meaning for me. Um, as I mentioned, I was born and lived till the age of 18, uh, pretty close to where we are right now. So this is on 23rd Street, um, all the way east of the FDR Drive. Um, in the mixed income Mitchell Lama housing project called Waterside Plaza, um, the tall buildings on the right. Um, for the next 18 years, I'm 36, I have lived mostly in Philadelphia after some time, this is Philadelphia. <laughs> um, <laughs> after some time spent in Chicago, San Francisco, Berlin, and working on several farms in the Northeast. I have now been in Philly for 13 years, a city which has really formed and supported me as an artist, offering inspiration in its simultaneous entropic decrepitude and teeming fertile reclamation, a curious characteristic of post-industrial cities. It has been interesting and concerning to watch Philadelphia teeter on a precarious edge now poised within the talents of developers' dreams. Um, and lastly, in terms of place, I have a deep and enduring connection to a town on the north fork of Long Island called Greenport, um, where my grandfather ended up and where my father lives, and uh, where we all have been part of oyster growing and marine restoration project for many years that my partner is now um, very involved with. And this is on Shinnecock and Korshaw land and waters. So, um, now I'm going to segue into talking about more work, but go through it um, quite a bit more quickly than the last piece. Um, place has been really formative to who I am as an artist. I think of it as not only a muse, but even a collaborator. Um, there is a quote by Robin Wall Kimmerer in the new Kinship series uh, anthology that says, it has been said that we are placelings before we are human beings or earthlings. I certainly feel like a placeling that some of my deepest relationships have been with places um, and that it is important work to engage with and bear witness to place, its history, its ecology, its relationships and transitions, particularly as exigencies such as ecological collapse, extractive relations, continued land thefts, forced diasporic migrations, wanton development and displacement imperil our sacred and sacredly banal places. To be in deep presence with and relation to our surroundings, to observe queer ecologies and resiliencies in the face of prevailing sameness, to process eco grief and community and foster regenerative futures, whether or not we will be there to witness them, does feel to me like a form of resistance. Um, this work is old, like over a decade ago, um, but it's something I was involved with when I first moved to Philadelphia. Um, I was part of a collective of botanists and artists um, who were deeply engaged with spontaneous urban plants. And at the time, Philadelphia had a lot more vacant lots, quote unquote, vacant lots. Um, so we would go around just labeling the plants, learning about them. That turned into kind of student engagement, mural making, public workshops, and kind of opened up the whole area of social practice for me, um, which I have an interesting relationship with. Um, yeah, um, this was some work from a few years. Beyond that, I got very interested in uh, the history of camouflage patterning and just the idea that you could take something as complex as a particular ecosystem and turn it into a system <laughs> um, into a kind of standardized system. And so I uh, started to make my own camouflage patterns through uh, photographs that I was taking of different neighborhoods in Philadelphia that were undergoing major uh, development and sort of thinking about the ways in which this like unique architecture and these long developed histories were getting kind of standardized into a rote sameness of, you know, CAD drawings and the like. 
Um, those are those images actually uh, on a building that is no longer standing, which is sort of the theme of a lot of this work. Um, this is just a, a photo project that I did um, actually while on this residency called Land Arts of the American West, which I recommend any folks look into if it sounds interesting to you. Um, but this was a residency that took us around uh, the Four Corners region. And we talked a lot on that trip about the idea of places that attract things that like emptiness. Um, and that's something that's really stuck with me in my work, like the idea of vacant spaces, but all that actually goes on in those kinds of spaces. Um, this is a, a piece of the spiral jetty in the Great Salt Lake, which is uh, also in a state of disappearance and um, something uh, to think about. This was one of my favorite projects I've done. And I did this at the tail end of grad school at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, 2015 was when Philadelphia really started to shift uh, in terms of development and the kind of vacant lots turning into these luxury housing type of things, which um, you know, I had also seen happen in New York prior to leaving. Um, there was one building in particular, this blue building here, that I just liked. I had done a lot of like foraging in this lot, and um, it always kind of looked to me like uh, a horizon or something kind of beautiful. And, I decided I, I was also sort of struggling always. I still am with painting and like what that means to me. And um, I had heard someone talk about, I'd heard the critic Michael Brunson talk about uh, painting as a devotional practice. And that really struck me. And so I decided to spend the summer in between my two MFA years making this 16 foot painting um, just of the building which I then wanted to install next to the building. And that was sort of the, that was, that was it. <laughs> that was the, the plan. Um, I was thinking about these developer signs that were up everywhere saying like coming soon and you know, here's the new building and, and instead offering sort of like a recursive reflection on what already was there. Um, but the project took on a life of its own when graffiti artist Tober tagged both my painting and the building. <laughs> <laughs> um, a friend texted me that day, like, just, I don't, yeah, it was, it was very exciting to everyone and, and me. Um, so I, I ran over and just, you know, started to document this space. Um, I ended up documenting this site for seven months. And in that time, there was a kind of wild conversation between graffiti artists, the building, the painting, and then the city of Philadelphia's anti-graffiti league, which would come out and buff both the painting and the building every two weeks approximately. <laughs> um, so this just went back and forth, um, you know, through the seasons. This was the back of the painting. Um, it, it was just a really interesting space. A lot of what was being written on the painting had to do with um, the opioid crisis and uh, sort of memorial themed writings. You can also see in the background um, sort of developers developing. And so the, the painting really became this kind of lens. Here it is looking pretty small. Um, here it is with a building that both burnt down and was getting developed at the same time <laughs> in the background. And here it is looking uncannily similar to the four by eight sheets of drywall that they're installing on a building. Um, one day, a particularly blustery day, uh, a sheet of plywood actually blew off of a neighboring construction site and just like right into the painting. And so that's how it ended, which I was quite ready for because it was <laughs> like, when is this gonna end? Um, so I ended up gathering the parts of the painting, which this one was pretty intact and this one wasn't. And uh, in, when I've shown it since, I um, sort of resurrect the big piece of the painting and then project 
onto it the kind of story just in images of um, documenting this whole this whole thing. Um, so I'm not going to play this whole thing, but you can get a sense here. Um, through the seasons. Um, so this is a newspaper that I made out of uh, some of the images from the documentation, which I offered in gallery exhibition, but more importantly, in a kiosk next to the building itself, um, so to sort of share with the community that had become interested in this point in this project. Um, this was up for a while until the kiosk got stolen. So that was the end of that <laughs> project. Um, moving on, so matter, uh, you know, in addition to place is a really important theme in my work and increasingly important to my thinking. Um, I think of uh, theorist Donna Haraway writing that um, it, it matters what matters we use to think other matters with. Um, I'm really interested in the materials that artists use and how they find them and also what it can mean to kind of um, eschew using materials that are offered to us through art supply stores or other uh, spaces like that. Um, in my own work, I tend to actually come upon matter first and then uh, figure out what I want to make out of it rather than the opposite way. Um, and I think that, um, I think of matter as almost like pieces of place, like the physical matter coming from a place that then gets turned into material to make into something meaningful, which is art. Um, this is the first public sculpture that I did at this funny art residency called Anne Marie Garden in Maryland. Um, this specifically had to do with marine history in the area and was meant to sort of evoke a core sample of what you might get if you were to dig into um, the road. So on top, there is like black top, like the highway. Um, there's a whole story to this, but in fact, most of the Eastern seaboard is uh, built on top of oyster shell. And um, as I was just saying to Mark, uh, oyster shell has a cementitious um, materiality that makes it a very good kind of bill. Uh, this was a huge blow to oyster populations to gather the shells um, because it took away a major fertilizing source for marine ecology. Incidentally, this piece, which was supposed to be permanent, uh, got demolished because a highway was being put in <laughs> to the edge of the, <laughs> the art center. Um, this was a piece, again, from the land arts experience, uh, just actually gathering like handfuls of, of ground wherever I went. And I think represented a moment for me of really learning about the history of, of Western expansion in the US and you know the idea of land grabbing and then thinking more broadly about like what does it mean all the time as artists to be using materials that is mined and extracted um, I've had a long-standing relationship with a waste management in Philadelphia called um, Revolution Recovery, which houses an artist residency called Rare. Um, and the first project I did at Rare was to create a large piece of paper using found fibers that we then uh, marbled on a nearby polluted estuary of the Delaware River, which is actually a Japanese printmaking method called Sumunagashi, which I didn't know at the time. Um, we weren't adding anything to marble the paper. And I should also say there's a really great uh, New York based artist named Sto Len who has like a whole practice based around this way of working if, if you're interested in that. Um, the last project I'll highlight in thinking about matter uh, was from 2017 and um, it was through a bigger curatorial project called Monument Lab. I was invited by the curators of Monument Lab to uh, pitch a new monument for the city of Philadelphia. Um, in light of the kind of demolition crisis in the city, Philly is actually the only 
Um, UNESCO recognized World Heritage City in the US, but we have like the worst uh, preservation policies. So everything is just getting torn down. Um, so I worked with a team of uh, demolition folks, um, people who are already doing demolition for the city to salvage stoops from buildings that were being torn down. Um, so salvaging masonry material, um, a lot of which is material that is now exhausted. Like you can't actually get these kinds of stone again because we've dug it all out of the earth. And so the idea that uh, the stone is being demolished and then like pushed back into the earth, like not even for future use is pretty concerning. Um, I wanted to make stoops um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, most notably, they're just a ubiquitous piece of architecture in the city of Philadelphia as they are in New York, um, and also a site of both kind of public and private space, like a, a threshold. Um, the place that I was installing these stoops uh, actually has a history as a, um, a potter's field, a public burial ground, and there's very little um, uh, public demarcation sharing like who is buried there and why and so I also wanted to kind of nod generally to the idea of buried histories um so here's some photos from that that project um it was really interesting I ended up working with the union of bricklayers and allied crafts workers to get help in putting the stoops back together. Each of these stones is a lot heavier than I had imagined when proposing this project. Um, so the project took place in Washington Square in Philly. And this was installation day. There was a team of students from a trade school helping to rebuild the stoops. And um, here we are doing it. Um, This was so this is after it was up. It, it was a really cool project uh, in part because of how the public just immediately used the stoops. There wasn't even any curatorial information up and people immediately knew kind of what to do with them. Um, I also really appreciated this was a performance by artist Marisa Williamson um, that was curated, but I, I really appreciated all of the uncurated activity around the stoops and um, also the way that the stoops incited people to tell their own stories, like they really brought out um, stories of people's, you know, where they grew up, what they had experienced, what architecture was like, et cetera. Um, if I have any misgiving about the project is that there was not enough documentation of those stories. Um, I don't know, like, go a little more quickly here, but. Um, time is another major kind of player in the way I think about making work. Um, these are works that all literally evoke Fox. Uh, I like to think about different kinds of time. And, um, and an example would be, you know, the Greeks had an idea of chronos, like chronological time, which is the time we agree upon, like for watches, um, but they also had a, a kind of time called Kairos, which was thought of as experiential time or poetic time, or, um, you know, when you walk outside of your house and you intend to go to the post office and then you get into a conversation and look at a flower and, you know, trip over something like that kind of time, like the time of your actual experience. And I love thinking about these different kinds of time. Um, I think they also help me to think about uh, kind of grief and how to process difficult experience. Um, and um, yeah, um, this is a more recent project that encapsulates uh, time in a, in a pretty deliberate way. Um, I started collecting these magnolia petals the first week of the pandemic when nobody knew what was going on and we were all wearing like nitrile gloves and nobody knew what to touch or all of that. Um, there was a magnolia blooming right by my house at that moment. And I started to notice these like trodden upon petals and they seemed safe enough to collect. And so I started doing that. 
Um, I, I was both interested in the way that the pedals kind of became branded, um, but also uh, realized at some point that this magnolia tree was also next to a COVID tent site. So I had this feeling that I was collecting um, these like traces of people that perhaps had COVID or were going to be treated. And I had sort of caught this like moment of, of that passage. Um, when I present this work now, I actually have uh, an image of the petals as they were when I first collected them. Um, and then as they are now, which is really like in a crumbled kind of desiccating state. Um, and I made this work the spring that the um, vaccine came out. So it sort of felt like a moment of completion of the pandemic, which ended up not really being true. Um, I also do a lot with takeaway prints. I like uh, the idea that people can sort of have something from an experience of art. Um, and here I felt like sort of the act of like plucking something felt reminiscent of the experience of making the work. Um, this bench incidentally is made from wood from a Dutch elm tree in Philadelphia that was the last of the uh, North American Dutch elms. They also succumbed to their own pandemic. Um, that was kind of interesting to me. I'm gonna skip this project. Um, speak to you. <laughs> um, yeah, and so to wrap up, I just wanted to share two more facets of what I think of as my work. Um, one is sort of writing, curating, scholarship, and advocacy. I should note, I'm not doing all of these things all of the time. Um, I'm doing like one of these things sometimes and then like seven of them another time and like it's it's you know um kind of a chaotic cluster but I think that I've come to realize that they're all very important to me and my way of working and and I sometimes wish um I, I always admire artists who are doing things kind of outside of their work and contributing to um what I see as as a consciousness in a wider way. Um, so some of the kind of quote unquote scholarship I've done has been around like the history of quote unquote land art. This was a project I did uh, visiting land art sites and projecting the images through which I had learned about the site through which most of us learn about these sites um, next to the current state of these um, land artworks and sort of showing um, both like the ecological change that's happened, but opening up a space for discourse around like what even the meaning of land art is today. Um, that was the setup for that, which I like <laughs> maybe better than the photograph. Um, this led to uh, actually working with a community art school in Philly to teach a land art class, which was really awesome because in doing that, I was able to sort of like reinvent a canon of like who I thought should be considered land artists and who people who are typically left out of that conversation. Um, I'm pretty involved in um, adjunct teaching advocacy work. I am part of a um, the United Academics of Philadelphia, which is a, a citywide um, academic union in Philadelphia. Um, you know, as I'm sure many of you know, these past few years have been like an incredibly fiery time in the history of higher ed and higher ed advocacy work. Um, so this was from some recent programming where I um, kind of shared uh, some of what I've learned about the history of higher ed um, that I think can be really helpful to navigating higher education and also envisioning a, a different um, higher, ed, higher ed system. Um, so this uh, fortune teller device contained all this information um, about different conditions and sort of tools for uh, working together to transcend some of them. Um, this was a, a curatorial project I did during the pandemic that was supposed to be 
a land-based project, but the pandemic kind of changed the shape of it. Um, the uh, waste management facility that I mentioned is adjacent to a Superfund site, which is a remediated toxic site. Um, and for this project, I worked with a team to get a group of artists together to create responses to the Superfund site um, and sort of help think through the history and future of this site as the um, owners of the waste management facility try to figure out what to do with this piece of land. Um, since we could not have everyone come to site and just like learn about it on site, we instead created a bazillion page uh, binder <laughs> about the history of the site, which ended up being this incredible document in its own right. And shout out to the designer, M. Slater, um, and Kristen Neville Taylor and Lucia Tomei for really making this thing happen. Um, and then we had artists essentially respond to what they took from this documentation. Um, this was a, a piece by New York-based artist Fields Harrington about the idea of remedial time. Legacy Russell contributed um, a really interesting piece about sort of the history of environmental degradation and its disproportionate effects on different populations. Uh, this was by um, Shinnecock artist Jeremy Dennis kind of envisioning an indigenous uh, kind of sculpture garden on the site. Um, this was more of a poetic interpretation by um, Ava and Marin Hassinger, uh, Kristen Neville Taylor. And then my response was an attempt to kind of tell the story of the site somatically. So through this um, kind of folding project, you would at each fold learn a piece of the history of the site. Um, and then in a very jubilant moment, we finally got to have um, an exhibition and to have everybody on the site, which was just really incredible um, to get like hundreds of people out to this uh, super fun site. And yeah, the last um, component of what I'd like to share is teaching. Um, teaching has meant a lot to me and I've done a lot of it <laughs> and I have not always been well supported and still am not by the institutions that I work with. Um, but I really value uh, what teaching offers to me in terms of kind of continually exciting my creative practice and um, serving as a form of, of community making and world building. And I think really, uh, despite its shortcomings, um, being a sort of space of um, a, a quote unquote, like revolutionary futurity, um, I think is what Paolo Freire calls it. Um, I have been really lucky to make connections to different people that are interested in kinds of teaching that I think are really important, um, specifically teaching that takes place uh, outside of institutional spaces and um, through working on projects and working with and learning from land. Um, as Mark mentioned, I did go back to school for um, a master's in education, which was kind of a surprise to me, um, but I received a grant at the start of the pandemic to do this uh, program and um, so I did a year of virtual school while also teaching full time in an MFA program um, and then finished up a semester uh, in person. And I've still been trying to make sense of that experience, but I know that the main thing that it gave me is was time to kind of envision what um, I think school could look like and um, something that I really want to keep uh, working on with other people. And, and so that leads to uh, matters, which is something I'm piloting right now as a class. Um, I received a grant through uh, the Sachs Foundation to design this class that's running as we speak at University of Pennsylvania, um, where we're basically thinking about where material 
for art and design comes from and where it goes. And we are visiting all sorts of sites and kind of uh, thinking in this land of pedagogy model. Um, and uh, it's going great so far. So um, these are some of the students at the materials library at Penn. It's a mix of um, mostly grads, some undergrads, actually mostly art architect and landscape architecture students and a few MFA students. Um, we visited the first paper mill in North America, which is right in Philadelphia, um, and kind of thought about colonial histories and um, indigenous erasure. Um, we made paper up there. We've been working closely with uh, the waste management facility. Um, so we've gone up there a few times. This is the super fun site. Um, this was visiting the work of artist Narendra Haynes, who deals with kind of biomaterial and dematerialization. Um, yeah, so we've been doing a lot. This was from a recent pinup. Um, and I'm really excited to see what the students uh, do towards the end of the semester. These, these were some early projects of students kind of making material biographies. Um, really fantastic work. I really liked this one. <laughs> um, yeah, so I will end there and, um, you know, just say that I hope that this talk might inspire you in various ways and namely in thinking about ways of existing as an artist that can help you feel expansive and not limited or confined in what you have to offer this world to your communities um, and to time <laughs> itself. So thank you very much. Um, I had two questions. Let's go with that. Um, for your painting, I, I didn't have the name. Did okay. you kind of have a name? Yeah. Did you, was that on the development of the site? Was it like a public <laughs> yeah. That's a great question. Um, I was pretty naive and uh, didn't know <laughs> what what the space was. I just knew that I never saw anyone there. Um, uh, the day that I was installed, this is an amazing story actually. I'm just remembering that this is an amazing story as I tell it. The day that I went to install this painting, this guy came out from the auto shop, like a body shop across the street. And he stood there and he said, nice painting. And I said, thank you. Um, and he, he owned this property, it turned out. The guy who owned the auto shop across the street owned the property that I put the painting on. And when I realized that, I was like, why, wow, you know, am I in trouble? You know, what's happening now? Like, like, what's gonna happen now? And he said, oh, it's okay. I have a daughter who goes to SVA. <laughs> and I completely forgot about that until this moment. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's the answer to that question, but he has been sold. If you were to go to the spot in Philly now, we could go through Google Earth, but I'll just let you imagine um, none of this is here. It's, it's all buildings. It's actually a building complex called Boston Commons, which doesn't really make, make any sense, but yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, okay, my second question is not fully formed. Um, I'm really interested in the political power of art, and you know, I you characterized um, some of your practice, and you said it feels like a form of resistance. Um, uh, and I, you know, we've been kind of, or you talked about how you're the art practice, and then you also have an advocacy and education practice, and I'm wondering, um, what, how do you feel about your own work and it's like political power or is it like a debate like your stoop? Is it just creating spaces of engagement? Like, yeah, I mean, how your your own um, pieces are engaging with political Yeah. Um, I think that 
I've realized, particularly in the past few years, that a lot of my work and maybe my reason for gravitating towards art has been to process grief. Um, uh, my mother had a degenerative illness that she contracted right when I was born. And so it was kind of like watching the sand, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, drop um, my whole life until she died when I was 25. I think that um, that experience and just sort of what having an experience like that will then bring into your field of consciousness. Uh, I think I think grief and making space for grief is what art has been for me and what I think that it does for others. Um, I think that beyond that, uh, I don't see my work as having like a major political function. I think that it makes space for people to come together and through that other things happen. Like with the Stoops project, there was a whole kind of association that formed called like Young Preservationists of Philly that a lot of it was like born out of just spending time in this project. Um, actually this project was sort of operating adjacent to a big movement called um, Development Without Displacement. So I, I, I think the work has like adjacencies to more direct political movements and action. I don't know that I think that it in and of itself is doing that work. Okay, and thank you for the research. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, you mentioned at the beginning um, some work, like farm work you mentioned early on, and also uh, a little bit mentioned the plant and water tending. Yeah. I was wondering if you consider that type of work, is that is that something that feels part of your practice or adjacent to our practice or along with that? Like is that something like how is that something that can be incorporated into our practice or something on your thoughts? Yeah. I think it's I know that it has been incredibly informative to my whole like way of thinking and working. I don't think I would have I don't think I would have the interest that I have in materials if I hadn't worked with land in such like an intimate way. Um, I don't know, I, especially when I was doing the We the Weeds work, I sort of saw this path opening up of like ecological art. And I felt often when we were invited to do things that it was really like a form of institutional greenwashing and like institutions saying like, hey, we have these people coming and planting this thing that's gonna like die in a month because that's how long the exhibition run is. And so I got a little bit sour to the world of ecological art. Um, I think it is funny that, you know, all these terms like land art and earth works and ecological art are sort of like othering an impulse to care about <laughs> ecology and the world. Like I kind of think that's something artists should just be doing and it doesn't have to put them into a separate category of making. Um, yeah, I think I'm still figuring out like how to merge all these things. I mean, I many times have thought of moving out to this town where my dad is, but like the real estate is so expensive. Um, you know, when I was working on farms and thought that might be an avenue I wanted to pursue seriously, I realized I couldn't figure out how to like support myself to do that. Like I kept meeting farmers who said, well, if you don't already have access to land or like, how are you gonna do this? Um, you know, this was like 10 years ago that I was having these conversations. I think a lot of things have changed uh, more collaborative modes of like people coming together to make land work more possible. Um, but yeah, I mean, I still, do kind of smaller versions of this work and I see it as part of my work. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> Hi, right, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I think the documentation plays a big role in my practice and I also feel like a lot of works are at the themselves 
you know, like apply for salt, or sometimes I do a lot of products and too. And when I saw your work on the magnolia, the first mm -hmm. magnolia, which was about like, which I felt like two results of um, almost at the beginning of the time phase and also like the results of the time phrase. And if if the thinking process or our thinking process is any different from other of uh, your art like pieces, how is that different? Is that right? Mm, almost. <laughs> so, I guess like I, I have a question about um how like the process of that can be mm. different. Uh, yeah. Um, it plays a very big role for sure, and I, I think the biggest thing I got out of grad school was learning how to use the camera, which like you don't have to go to an MFA program to do, but um, and and you know getting a sense of. The importance of documentation. Um, I think I don't know really how to answer the question other than to say at some point documentation just like became part of the process of working. And honestly, I think a lot of that has to do with um, like just the shape of my life and like a lot of my life the past. 10 years has been like working lots of different jobs, like having like constant upheaval and negotiation of time. And so I think, I do think sometimes documentation is like a shortcut to other processes I might have wanted to explore, but don't have time to do. Um, yeah, I'm still trying to figure that out. And, and but I think at some point I sort of let go of like, well, I really would have liked to, you know, like make a series of prints from these petals and like grind them down and turn them into a brick and build a house and like do these 800 other things I don't have time for. Instead, I'm just gonna like take a photograph. I think I've come to accept that as like a viable reality of being an artist and having to make choices and live with like constraints. I don't know if that answered. <laughs> so who's interested in that project that um, anything has to do to use on that season? Or you made it in blue and blue and place it in blue. And who's that side of just really exciting me? And there's one of the two where they don't really tend to get like whoever two it is, they got it. It was wonderful way and responded to it and participated in it. And I noticed at one point you said something, something, social practice. Yeah, one of the interesting relationships. Mm -hmm. In one of the goals of the much, if not most, social practice work, in fact, one of the defining characteristics, perhaps. Is is this aspiration to engage community for that in a kind of collaborative participation mm -hmm. with with the artists to do the work in its most idealistic form, co-creating and taking it in directions that the artists maybe didn't imagine well beyond the control. So not just like a bunch of people out on the shovel of sand and Francis police, mm -hmm. but Something like this. It just seems to happen in this case, not as a result of your like showing up in a bunch of community meetings, and but by your being in a place and being kind of deep time with it, and then taking this action and then being there for, for months and months where it's unfolding. Which is something that a lot of social practice doesn't doesn't have the advantage of that kind of extended engagement. People are just parachuting in, mm -hmm. parachuting out, are super busy. And I just so this becomes a question when I ask, what could you unpack that I have an interesting relationship with it? And maybe share us share with us some lessons that you can learn. Yeah. Um yeah. 
Um, that's a great question. Uh, so I, I had thought when I was looking at MFA programs, I had thought of doing a, an MFA in social practice, um, which I didn't do. Uh, I've taught in a social practice MFA program at Moore College of Art. Um, I have a relationship to it, and maybe that's clear in the work, but I, I think what you just said about the difference between sort of holding community meetings and and trying to sort of I don't want to say force participation but invite participation in a heavy-handed way of a supposed community uh, versus something more organic and elective um, I think I just started to realize I was more interested in kind of chance and happenstance and the way that people overlap, the way that communities overlap in urban spaces, uh, kind of not with any sort of engineering to make it happen. Just, it, it is what is happening. Like this field is used by, you know, me and my friends to look at plants. It's used by sex workers. It's used by opioid users. It, 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 there are already these like layers of use um, in this supposedly vacant lot. Um, and I think that's more interesting than, uh, I don't know, than, than using art to kind of construct purposefully a community. That said, like, I'm part of my neighborhood associations. I go to lots of different meetings for different issues. And um, I think I realized that for me, like mixing art and that kind of work wasn't working. I felt like I wasn't like helping as an artist and I was, uh, there was just something that never felt right. Um, I don't think that's like true across the board. And I think it has a lot to do with like different people's identities and relationships to communities. And, um, but yeah, I mean, another thing that comes up here is like a lot of the projects I showed, like the stoops and um, some other public works, like I had to apply for grants and I have a institution kind of breathing down my neck about like what I'm going to make and how high is it and will they get sued and what if this happens and that and whereas this like I made a painting and I took the stupid risk of like putting my body out in this space. Um, but it was just like my decision. It wasn't um, in relation to some institution. And yeah, I mean, I think I don't, yeah, I think these are things everyone has to navigate in their own way. And I just have over time, uh, I think preferred to work in this way than a more intentionally organized way. Did you, did you say that you had noticed that building when you were foraging in that lot? I think that's when I first, I don't know like which came first, the building noticing or the forge in the lot. But. Yeah, that's pretty cool too. That it's not like you're trying to, you know, intervene or do something with some community elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But it seems like it's, you're kind of part of that community. Yeah. Even as an artist and something. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I lived here. I had I what I, I am part of this community. Like it, I don't know that I could have done the project if I didn't feel in some way a part of the community. Um, whatever the community is, like more than human, not just human community. Um yeah, the, I guess the other thing, I, I have a lot of friends who like work in social practice and I think they have much clearer skills that they bring to certain kinds of projects like design skills or facilitating skills. I don't know that I have those. And so I found like, well, I'm just like an artist at this project. And I, I didn't, so um, yeah, it's just like a sub answer. Before I, I hand the mic over to the, 
Next question. I just want to embarrass you even further. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that's a long introduction. So it's more than you guys. Um, last week we had Solomon Four, his work is like who's just at like that by the gallery, etc. etc. And a couple weeks ago we went around here and just want to see what you want to do with um, it is true. Um, and this is uh, in the different kind of conventional action of the Queen's against the festival for the Philippines. And maybe we call them like at the beginning or like the end of the bottom of the Queen's. And I think that this is the way we are. And the Queen's against the festival. So um, I think it's working. <laughs> this is challenging, I know. To, I'm juggle agent positions and all that. And there isn't maybe as much limelight for you as there might be for some other artists who's really good for you. You can just your life in a way seems to really as you put it, like the expanse, you know, allowing you to live more expansive than the Thank you. What's your point of Yeah, thank you. I mean, awesome. I couldn't have done this life here in New York. And I think it's important to kind of remember those realities. Um, it's a trust fund. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, everybody makes decisions, but Philly as like, uh, yeah, I, I, I think where you try to be um, has a big influence on how you can live clearly. Anyone else, questions, feelings, feelings? Oh my god, <laughs> I like feelings. Hi, um, I feel like we should be much of all the time, so I'm just gonna give it a comment. But before I came here, Isabel had emailed me about you and said that yeah, yeah. <laughs> we might have some commonalities in our work and the way of thinking, and I'm seeing that go through really. And I'm hoping to speak to you on the sixth when you do the back. I'll ask you a bunch of questions then. Great. Yeah, I'm just excited. Yeah, thank you.